our next next speaker is, is Becky Steck from the University of Michigan, from um, Mateus Kressler's group. And um, is there another, another example. All right. Thank you very thank much, you. Rudy. And uh, thank you guys all for hanging in there. We're in the home stretch, all right? So um, let's see. So I've titled my talk, Mind the Gap. Um, what I want to do in this couple minutes here with you is tell you how we uh, in Dr. Kretzler's lab are using Transmart to uh, fill the gap that exists between our lab and all of the different academic and industry partners that we work with on a daily basis. Um, just uh, quickly what I'll go over is a little bit about the ASBC, which is what I'm a part of and our lab is a part of, explaining this gap that exists for us uh, and how we use Transmart to fill it, of course. Um, and then I'll go over a couple of our challenges, kind of our wish list opportunity, um, tell you a little bit about what, where we're going next. Uh, so uh, to start with, what is the ASBC? And uh, just a trigger alert, uh, there's gonna be a lot of acronyms here. I know this audience is used to them, uh, but I will try my best to explain what all of these are, where it's applicable. So the ASBC is the Applied Systems Biology Corps which is part of a kidney center at the University of Michigan, the George M. O'Brien Kidney Translational Core Center, to be specific. Um, but uh, the ASBC, the real goal behind the ASBC is that we need to find a way to help uh, uh, integrate all this different uh, what uh, small science, I believe is what Brian called it earlier today, that's going on with uh, comprehensive data that exists, all this genome-wide data we're getting, um, and really marry these two up and marry up the, uh, the deep um, biological clinical knowledge that we have from a lot of researchers in the university with the relevant genome data that we also are collecting. Uh, so, and of course, this is for renal disease, specifically the ASBC and the Beeman Kidney Center is focused on renal disease. And we really are just trying to uh, see if we can help improve patient outcomes at the end of the day, which everyone is, right? Um, there's three kind of main ways that the ASBC gets at this. Um, and I'll go into that in more detail here, but we do a lot of just kind of one-on-one -on -one custom work for folks. Um, we try to automate and kind of semi-structure things that happen a lot so that we can turn it around quicker and with more uh, reliability. And we also have a lot of work just in the uh, community outreach trying to make the whole renal community uh, have access to some of the things that we're doing in-house. Uh, for the visual learners, um, this is kind of the, the way we like to, to uh, represent this, uh, that we try to sit in right in the middle of all of that different work between the clinical research, functional genomics, and those, uh, all the model system work. There's a lot of work done right now in mice in the nephrology community and among others. Okay. Uh, but going back to those three core functions, I just want to um, walk you through in a little more detail what those look like for the ASBC. So the first, um, this one we, we call interactive one-on-one -on -one data mining. That's a little vague. vague. It really uh, is meant to be vague though because in essence, it's just a custom service project for whoever and whatever. Uh, so I pulled up, uh, that's just a list of the people that we have available to do different types of work, the scope of work we can do. Uh, but there in that blue box, you can see that we did work for 11 different institutions in 2014, um, 12 different projects. So it's not like we're only serving the University of Michigan community. Lots of nephrologists will come to us and say, here's what we want to do, and we'll try to do it for them. Uh, so right now, halfway through the year, we're already doing 11 different projects for six different institutions. Uh, team's going to kill me, but just a quick uh, shot of that is a, a subset of the people you see there at a high ropes course. That was unfortunately the best photo I had with the most people in it. So um, apologies to them. <laughs> Thankfully, none of them are here, so they have no idea that I've done that. Um, <clears throat> But then, as I said, when we try, when we think we have something that's a bit more repeatable, um, we try to make it more standard. So uh, things that are in high demand, we try to uh, just make a consistent workflow that people, so that people can always get the same results. Um, a lot of times it's either marker identification using gene expression data, pathway mapping, uh, and doing that pathway mapping with tissues, species, different diseases, and the like. Uh, the last part, uh, and this uh, might be kind of taboo, but I'm actually plugging a little different uh, technology here, but um, we are, uh, as I said, we, it's important for us that we have uh, research in the, or outreach in the renal research community and that we try to help them serve themselves when they can. 
Um, and one of the ways that we have done this is with a software that's called NephroSeq. Uh, so this is a kidney expression, gene expression software, uh, sorry, kidney specific gene expression software. So we bring in lots of publicly available gene expression data sets, mostly from GEO. Lots of them have been created by our own lab and research that we've done. And we put them in this uh, database where we have curated the data to kind of a kidney specific uh, controlled vocabulary. It might be a stretch to call it an ontology. I'll say it's a controlled vocabulary. And uh, then we have systematic analyses that run against that so that you can uh, visualize quickly uh, gene expression data, um, you know, look at your gene of interest. Maybe you can go into the software in two ways. Usually you have a gene of interest and you want to look and see what we know about it in our database. Or you have a disease of interest or some sort of phenotype of interest and you want to see what genes are, of, are interesting within that phenotype. So that is the way that we right now best provide community outreach to everyone because NeferSeq is available for free to any academic or nonprofit uh, user. So if you all wanted right now, you could go to neferseek.org and get yourself uh, a registration. Probably not a lot of nephrologists in here, but if you are there, you know. So I'm sure you're wondering, okay, that's great, but what was that gap uh, you were talking about? Yes, let me tell you. So going back to the slide one more time, I said that we need to act as a bridge, right? That kind of implies that there's a gap. Uh, so the way I'm going to explain this gap to you is really by taking you through three different uh situations in which we use Transmart, I think the gap will become apparent. So the first one uh, that I want to talk to you about is uh, a network that we call Neptune. So I, I know I said there's going to be a lot of acronyms. Another thing I'm sure you guys are not surprised to see is that uh, sometimes we get a little creative with the acronyms, right? And Neptune is a bit of a stretch there, but it stands for the Nephrotic Syndrome st Study Network there, right? So um, if, uh, like, uh, um, sorry, I'm skipping ahead here. So the Neptune is, if, if you were listening to Kat's presentation, she kind of explained how, you know, to do a big longitudinal study, it can take years and years just to recruit patients. Well, that was what Kat was describing is exactly what Neptune is. So it is a big longitudinal study that's taken us years and years to recruit patients, but uh, it is a, a multi center study. So there's actually 23 different centers involved in U.S. and Canada. Um, we're working to recruit 500 patients, and we actually have done that, um, which is, yeah, deserves, at least I give myself a clap for that. Um, and uh, with Neptune, we're now actually in the second of uh, two five-year funding cycles. So uh, it's got a lot of momentum, and that means we've also been able to follow the patients. So we have longitudinal data um, going on five years and, and then some. So, um, but this, the goal of Neptune was to bring all these teams together to, you know, understand the treatment of nephrotic syndrome and how we can uh, better improve that, right? But here's the gap. The problem is part of the remit of, of this Neptune network was that we wanted to make this data available. So this longitudinal study, right, it has a case report form that has to be filled out that has like a thousand, literally over a thousand data elements every visit. Um, but we wanted to be able to give that to our researchers, the same ones that these same investigators that are recruiting these patients, so they could go take it back to their labs and do other research with it. Uh, you know, hopefully just continue to feed the beast. Um, but how in the world can we get 23 different uh, institutions access to this thousands of data points over multiple visits going on five years of visits now? Um, the answer is not in an Excel spreadsheet, right? Uh, so how and how do we actually make that something where they're not only taking it to their own home so they can do their own work on it, but they can collaborate with each other because that was really another point to this Neptune consortium was that they're working together and utilizing each other's strengths, right? Um, and how do we then share findings? So uh, one other thing, I guess, let me go back here for a second. You'll see the second to last bullet there says that it supports over 60 pilot and ancillary studies using this Neptune data. So really what happens is we have the, those initial data elements. There weren't a thousand at first. There were maybe 800. Um, but then as the study went on, we realized, you know, what would be really cool is if we grabbed this data too. Because if we got that information in-house, we could do something else. Or, hey, when I was working on this in my lab, I found that this piece of information is really important you should really start collecting that. Or how about if I get the grant money, I'll start collecting it and then I'll share it with you. And that's really what those pilot and ancillary studies are, is uh, pieces of additional data that we've, that we're, 
that we're working on that we think would be cool. We try it out, we run the study, and then we turn around and put it back into the data set if we think it's worth it. And so that is why our data points, they continue to grow um, as we've learned new information about the diseases. So, so that's the gap is how in the heck we do we do it. Pretty sure you guys, spoiler alert, know the answer here. Uh, we have used Transmart to do it. So the way we've done this in Neptune is that we've actually created an instance that uh, we had to slightly customize it. I'll explain that in a second. Um, but this instance of Transmart really only has one data set in it, but it is for those 120 plus and growing consortium members. And so uh, a couple of things we had to do, because this is data that we want uh, to keep de-identified, uh, research data. Uh, one of the things, some of the things that we did to customize is that we actually removed some of the functionality from Transmart. We removed the grid view functionality and the data export functionality. Grid view, in essence, you see it as a table form. Um, and that just made it a little too easy for uh, our investigators to export that data and then get their hands and accidentally re-identify patients. And we're, um, that's something that the Neptune network is very concerned about. So that's just a safeguard that we threw in there. Another thing we did was actually added a little uh, spoiler page at the beginning that uh, just warns people kind of a data use agreement. Hey, you're part of Neptune. That means you can't re-identify patients. You can't do these things. Yes, you know, you know, you click I agree and you move on. You click I disagree and you just get kicked back to the login screen. So that's just one way that we helped kind of just um, add a little more uh, feeling of security, I guess, to, to this application. But uh, what we do now is all 120 uh, Neptune Consortium members have access to this. Uh, I, I personally uh, created user accounts for each one of them, which I'll get to <laughs> as I talk about the challenges in Transmart. But uh, we have, um, the, it's called our study annotation file, or SAF, gets generated on a monthly basis, actually, which is just kind of a new data snapshot of all the data and all the visits that are being collected. We take uh, a, a SAF a quarter and turn it around and kind of re-curate all that information and put it in Transmart. So for Neptune, there's actually one instance that has one data set in it, um, but one very powerful data set that continues to grow. Um, so right now, uh, there's over 500 patients in that. Um, five years of follow-up data for some of the patients that were recruited early on. Um, and uh, similar to what we did in NeferSeq, we had to develop our own vocabulary to help organize this. I said, you know, there's over a thousand data elements per visit. That wall of words, just the way, same way it doesn't work in Excel, it doesn't work in a list down the side of the screen either. So um, over here, just for a second, I can show you on the left is just the, a quick snapshot of that data attestation that we, that extra page that we threw in the middle. Um, and on the right is just kind of the, high level, a little opened up of this vocabulary that we had to create. Um, so now that we've created this, we have a nice process to every time we get a new study annotation file, uh, for the most part, it's easy, easy peasy, but it's anytime there's new data elements that have been added or improvements that have made to the properties, we just have to do a little more mapping. Um, so yeah, there's Neptune data. It's not all just uh, this uh, phenotypic data though. There's also gene expression. Uh, there's histopathology data. Um, I think I put that in twice, just spelled wrong once. Um, <laughs> targeted proteomics data. So there's lots of different data types that we have in there as well. Um, so, you know, in the last, uh, Ramon was just talking about how one of his dreams is that while they're in a meeting and they're talking about a problem, that you can just look it up and see the answer right there. That's actually something that we do with Neptune. Neptune has two meetings, face-to-face -face meetings every year, and I attend those meetings for the express purpose of giving anyone training if they have questions and they didn't get to do one of my monthly training sessions, but also to sit, listen to the discussions, and if they have an interesting question, Look it up for them right there in Transmart. So that's actually something that we're doing right now. The dream has been realized, right? So um, that's a really cool thing that we do with Neptune, and that's just a way that Neptune has helped us fill that gap with the collaborators. So the next one I'll tell you about is uh, called CureGN. Uh, now, CureGN is a multi-center, five-year cohort study of glomerular disease patients. Hmm, sound familiar? <laughs> Hopefully, because it's very similar to Neptune. Um, in, in some cases, CureGN was, uh, it's almost a competitor to Neptune. It was another, uh, just more grant money that was, uh, that 
they wanted more options besides just Neptune for patients to get recruited for, but actually uh, some patients move right from Neptune into CureGN. So it's kind of a friendly rivalry, um, but there is sometimes some recruiting challenges between the two data sets and fighting for who gets the patients first. Um, but Cure is trying to follow 2,400 patients, so it's a little larger scale. Um, Cure is also, though, in its um, early stages. So for Cure, uh, we did the same thing. Because it worked, it ain't broke, don't fix it. So we've made another individual instance just for the Cure GN researchers. Uh, now, actually, uh, just yesterday is when we released it for the first time to the Cure GN researchers. Um, this one is going to have data releases only two or three times a year, just based on budgets. Um, uh, and again, it's th that same idea that we're reusing uh, that same data set over and over as it, as it grows, just continuing to curate. We were able to borrow the organi data organization from Neptune, and that data organization was, had been inspired by NephroSeq, that other uh, software that I showed you earlier. So we are starting to build uh, a, a really nice vocabulary for talking about uh, clinical properties in kidney disease. Um, <clears throat> And right now, since CURE is still early, we only have kind of lots of phenotypic data, medical history, and lab information, but we fully expect that the data types that are in CURE are going to be just growing as well. Um, here's just a glimpse of the what the CURE data looks like in the Transmart Navigate Terms section for anyone that's curious. Um, but we have the third project I want to take you through is slightly different. Um, and this one's kind of interesting. Uh, Brian at the beginning uh, was talking about one of the historical issues was these pre-competitive consortiums. Um, well, we're bringing it back from the dead uh, because we have, uh, Dr. Kretzler has kind of pulled off the unimaginable in, in uh, kidney disease where he has launched what we're calling RPC2, which is the Renal Pre-Competitive Consortium. And what this is, we actually have, so the researchers at the university, we have partnered with three different competing pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> they are all working together with each other and with us. So not we're not, it's not hub and spoke. We are all in this together. Um, in the press release about RPC2, uh, Dr. Kretzer was quoted as saying, we have to find ways to bring new therapies to our patients faster. And this is what we decided is that, listen, we have lots of expertise, lots of R&D expertise within all these companies. If only we could work together, we've got lots of data at the University of Michigan, we have got to see if we can start sharing some information and come up with markers that are worth studying, that are druggable targets, and we got to do it fast. Um, so we're hoping that this gains a lot of momentum. So it actually was kicked off officially. It's been Matthias's dream for years now. And we kicked it off officially in January. And the reason Dr. Kressler isn't here right now is because he's meeting with them to do a six month, how are we doing right now across the ocean? So um, I think the answer, we're, well, first let's go again to what the pain point is here. It's a little different situation now, right? Um, in this particular situation, we have lots of data, uh, not just one data set. We want to give them all the data we have. We want to get all the data they have. So we have um, lots of data types that we want to share and we want to share it with everyone. Uh, and we also have users from multiple disciplines. Now, and that's actually a, a good point that I should have made earlier. With Neptune and CureGN, a lot of our users are clinicians, right? And so we want, uh, they're not necessarily the bioinformatics powerhouse power users. They are clinicians that just want to be able to drag and drop and see something cool. And, um, but here we have, we kind of run the gamut. We've got, you know, the R gurus and we have folks from uh, tech transfer and IP that all want in on, the, on, tra on Transmart and what we're doing with, with it for RPC2. Um, but most importantly, we want to, there's two other things that are kind of unique here. We really want to make sure that folks are focused on sharing results in a way. In Neptune and CureGN, it it's a little easier because these guys are already kind of playing for the same team. But in RPC2, it is something that is against their natural tendencies uh, to, to share the results. And so we wanted to make sure that was up front and center for them, that this, this is something that you can do and you must do. Um, but then the other trick we have is that we have multiple data sets, but we'd love to be able to, where appropriate, put them all together, combine these different cohorts so that we can have just more power in numbers. Uh, so again, uh, we look to Transmart to do this. Uh, so RPC2 right now, there's about 40 consortium members who have access to it. Um, and the beauty of it is that it doesn't require the sophisticated bioinformatics knowledge. Um, so that's on the 
right there is an image of, right now we have two different uh, data sets in it. We have a C -co cohort and an ERCB cohort. And uh, those patients were like right now running RNA-seq data on them, um, on these very same patients. That, so we have gene expression data in, and then just some limited clinical data, right? Some demographics, a couple of renal markers. So, um, but then we also have on the top there, the across trials functionality is something that we uh, are leaning heavily on in Transmart as that way to solve the problem of uh, combining those different data sets, right? So because uh, we have those different user types, but Transmart can handle that because it's an interface that once you get the hang of it, makes sense. Um, we have all that functionality there for sharing and exporting. We didn't take away grid view and data export in RPC2 view because that's actually very powerful and important for these users. And um, we had developed a process just with the team to figure out when they have new findings, how to do it, how to bring it back in. So. Um, just those are three of the places that we're using Transmart. We're using it other places as well, and that's kind of what this slide is showing you. It's just uh, Neptune is going to have an arm in China as well. Um, but really overall for us, it's that we have this shared ontology is a really important part of putting this all together and um, that this data can be shared. So um, quickly moving on to just talking a little bit about some of the challenges that we have, because they're, I think, slightly different than challenges that maybe other people will encounter. So for us, one of the challenges is user management. Right now, for instance, in Transmart, there's not a forgot password ability. So if you forget your password, you email me and I make it up <laughs> and send you a new one. Um, and for, for having, you know, Neptune has 120 users, CureGN, I just released it yesterday, it already had 40 and it has 20 more that we're asking for access this morning. Um, that's why I was working feverishly in the back of the room. And uh, RPC2 is around that same amount. That, that's all um, manual, manually done by me right now. And so, but for lots of folks, that's not going to be a barrier that it is for me. And so I'll explain where that comes in on my next slide. Uh, another thing is just sometimes data organization. This is something we're all familiar with already. This is not unique to Transmart, but sometimes we have to get a little creative with how we organize things when we want them to show up a certain way in the tree. So for us, we have like a enrollment visit and then a baseline visit and the biopsy visit and then the follow-up visits. And how do you get those to sort nicely in, in visit order, right? You know, it's not problems we can't solve, but it's just something that every time we have to scratch our head about and rethink. Uh, and then, you know, there's some bugs sometimes. Now, full disclosure, we are on uh, version 1.2, right now 1.2.2, I believe. And so hearing you guys talk about all of the of this uh, release code governance initiative, oh my gosh, my heart was singing because I think that uh, it, across trials especially is something that we really need to work for RPC2. And that's something we've seen some bugs in. So uh, one of my colleagues is back in Ann Arbor right now trying to get 16.2 off the ground for us because so we're really thankful that Transmart has the Transmart Foundation that we have a group of people who's worried about this too so um, so a lot of those things are we can be confident that someone's probably working on it and if we're the ones that work on it we can give it to others too so that's really great for us so um, Moving on, just to talk a little bit about what we're doing next in Transmart. Obviously, we have those continued releases that I was talking about quarterly, a couple times a year. RPC2, we have that process to add new uh, data when it's available. Um, we're working to upgrade, as I just said. Um, we're, we also have additional data types. So we know we have RNA-seq data coming for RPC2. We've got GWAS data that's sitting on a shelf waiting to be put in there. So those are all things. Right now, we have uh, one person that is, that is kind of the, the loader of data. So um, he's a little bit busy uh, and we're, we would like to keep them that way. Um, another thing we want is that we're wondering why we don't use this just for ourselves to collaborate, right? A lot of times if you need to get data from so-and-so, you ask them and they give you a stick or they email you or maybe they maybe there's a spot, one spot on the network where you can go get it, right? Um, but we're starting to ask ourselves why aren't we using Transmart for our, just for ourselves, eating our own dog food there. And um, we have a software developer uh, that's kind of dedicated to helping us support Transmart here at the, at the University of Michigan. And so we have at times, just like when we made our own data attestation page, we kind of went off, off the reservation a little and made something ourselves. We're considering whether or not it's worth it for us to do that for the user management. Maybe we'll be the ones that make a forgot password button and uh, turn around and you know give that back to the community. So if if we're the ones that do it first, that's fine by us. We'll do it when it's the highest priority for us to do. 
So, um, and then if there's other uh, customizations that uh, are of interest to our members, that's we're considering some of those. Like uh, an example is they wanted a, on data exports, they wanted that same warning that you know this is uh, protected data that you should be careful with. Uh, that's an example. Um, but uh, just kind of to, to summarize here, um, the key takeaway for us is that we're taking all this data, we're processing it, and we can put it into a, a relatively intuitive form for our user base. That means that they can do great analyses, and they don't have to be bioinformatics wizards to do them. Um, right now, we, we recognize that we're not even getting all of the muscle out of Transmart because we're mostly using it for some deep uh, phenotypic data and for gene expression data, um, but we know it's coming. We know that we're generating that data, so it's coming for us, and we know that Transmart is there waiting to, to receive it. <laughs> um, so I guess I want to give you just uh, one little story to finish out my time is that um, with uh, Transmart, I uh, at the university with this with ASBC and all uh, the support person, right? I'm the one making passwords and I'm also the one that trains folks. And so recently I got to train a doctor from uh, Boston University that was visiting Ann Arbor and he had he's a Neptune investigator. He has Neptune data um, and a special ancillary study that he's doing on uh, the gene PLA2R. And so while I was giving him training, he said, OK, so just let's just do this really quick, right? And so he sat down and he was able to drag and drop the diseases of interest into his subsets, right? And then we went over to our advanced analysis, did a box plot of PLA2R, and he said, yes, that's it. See it, it's right there. I'm writing a paper on this right now. I'm taking a screenshot, I'm gonna show everyone back at home. He was so excited and it seemed something that to me was so simple. Oh yeah, I do it in a training every time. You drag and you put a gene and you know, you blah, blah, blah. But for him, it was it was a miracle because he didn't have access to do that before. And, and that made his day, even it's something that he's writing a paper on, right? So he's probably spent years or people years on that image right there. And we were able to just put it right in front of his face um, with a drag and a drop. And that is why I would say that we're experiencing a lot of success with Transmart and encourage you to try as well. So thank you. Yes. So the question was, how do we handle visit data? Uh, so for us, the visits are on a particular schedule. And so we, uh, the, the patients within these studies, because, because these are, they have to follow the study schedule. So it's, you know, there's, I said that baseline visit, but then it's the three to six month follow-up visit and the nine to 12 month follow-up visit. So they have a certain range. And so, yes, yeah, so, so it's predetermined. Now we also keep, so some of the data that we also keep though are days between visits and days since enrollment. So those are properties that we provide in case people want to, you know, maybe only look at patients that had, were within a certain range of days from each other or things like that. So we don't keep date, but we keep days from data. And then we organize by these pre, predetermined visits. Okay, great. Thank you very much, it was very nice.